one of you out there that is not curious, who's not looking for answers. As a young man, I was raised on a dirt farm, went to a little country church, and to be quite frank with you, I cannot remember one lesson that I learned in the church. I asked all kind of questions, and I spent many years looking for a denomination that pleased me. Instead of me trying to please the Almighty, I was trying to find a religion, a denomination, something that that fit my lifestyle, something that would give me answers. But unfortunately, most of the people that I ran into, they didn't have any answers for me. I remember, if I might digress for just a moment, going back to Sunday school, it puts me in mind of a story of a little boy. His mother sent him off to Sunday school. She wanted Johnny to be a good little fella. And he went to school and came back home, and his mother says, well, how was Sunday school? And he said, oh, it was, it was interesting. She said, well, tell me about it. What did you learn? Well, Mama, they talked about a fellow by the name of Moses. And there was a bunch of people called the Egyptians and chased Moses and all of his kinfolk and his friends chased him across the desert and until they come to this great Red Sea and they couldn't get across. And, and so suddenly Moses got a great idea and he started praying and uh, this fellow called God sent in the Marines and they built a pontoon bridge across the river and they all got away. And then when uh, the Egyptians got to the middle of the bridge, the Marines blew it up. She says, Johnny, she says, that's ridiculous. She said, uh, she said, I've never heard it told that way. He said, Mother, if I told you how it was really was, you wouldn't believe me. And this is very much the way I felt about it as a young man because I didn't like the answers that the teachers gave me. And I'd ask them, what is an angel? And they never bothered to tell me that that was a Greek word that in the original Hebrew, which you'll find in some different books that we'll be mentioning, like the Friar Fenton Bible, uh, um, James Moffat Bible, they use the original Hebrew word messenger. And I had asked my teachers, I said, where do they come from? And she'd say, from heaven. And I said, what does heaven mean? And they would point to the sky and they would say, out there. And so I said, why don't you just say outer space? And they said, well, the Bible says heaven. So actually we find heaven is an ancient, archaic word that is referring to outer space, the planets, the sky out there. So I became very curious when I heard in the New Testament about a fellow by the name of St. Paul spoke of the fact that he was taken up to a third heaven. And that never made any sense to me, and I was always very curious, even as a little boy, and even as I got into my 20s, I started to wonder, how come nobody's ever questioned that? I, then I became further confused when I'd read the Old Testament and it'd tell about Moses and the people wandering around out there in the desert for... Uh, approximately 40 years and then it told about a rock that followed them and I said that doesn't make any sense at all and then I would get into the New Testament and I said that that rock that followed them was Christ and I said why do they call Christ a rock and then I'd ask the preachers and teachers why haven't you explained that to me oh, we just want to explain to you where we're coming from now as I find that as we get into the cultures of the ancient Aztecs, Toltecs, the Mayans, and the Incas, and I've had the pleasure of talking to many different types of Indians up in Canada, and I talked to a very famous Indian in Sedona, Arizona, while I was on my honeymoon over 25 years ago, and he used to talk about the gods or the sons of God as he would break it down that came from the sky, would come down on the earth and play with the children of men, and I said, well, white bear I said well, what are you who do you think you are he said I don't think he said I know who I am now he had written quite a wonderful book he had written down the lore of his people he said I believe that I am one of the last of the ancient people of Mu and Lemura and he was sitting there and he was carving kachina dolls while he talked to me and I said what do these kachina dolls represent to you he said, these are the sons of God that used to come from the sky, and they would come down here on the earth, and they would play with me and my ancestors, so to speak. And he says, and we keep this tradition alive. We remember when the gods came, and we believe that someday they'll come back. 
Well, to be quite frank with you, at the time I was an agnostic, that's a cowardly atheist, and he was a very good-looking man. He was very intelligent, very educated, and had written one of the most fascinating books that I had ever read. But I thought maybe the fellow had eaten too many peyote buttons. So I went back home, and I met a lady who was, well, I hate to use this word, she was very religious, seemed to be very sincere, very spiritual, and she was quite a student of ancient books and of the Bible, and I told her about this spaced-out Indian that I had met. And she says, well, that's not ridiculous. She said, even your Bible tells you that. And I said, well, I don't have one. I said, show it to me in your Bible. So she got her Bible out, and she proceeded to show me in the uh, eighth chapter of Proverbs. She said, here's what you must understand. It tells you, with all of thy getting, which is far more important than gold and jewels and silver and, and the things that you seem to be looking for. You're looking for material things, but she said, you should get wisdom first. You should get knowledge, and then comes wisdom. And I said, well, that's fine, lady. Go ahead, pontificate. But I said, answer my question. She says, you read right here in the eighth chapter of Proverbs. It tells about the sons of God. In Christendom, you call that the Elohim, meaning sons of God, or this God or this uh, mysterious deity that many of us are not acquainted with because we don't understand him. And it tells in there about when the sons of God used to come down on this earth in the habitable parts and play with the children of men. Well, it was years later that I started to research, and I found as I studied through the uh, Chaldean, the Hebrew, and the Greek, that there was many different ancient men. There was all types of men. And a lot of the religious world, unfortunately, they're prejudiced against scientists. And they think that these scientists are all atheists. Well, if you're a real genuine scientist, you cannot refute that there has to be something or somebody that put all this together, some source of knowledge that is far greater than we really understand. So I remember one time going up into Canada and I was trading with some different Indians up there for uh, these beautiful deerskin jackets they would make. And one day I was talking with this particular Indian and I said, those are really wonderful carvings you had there. Did you carve them? And it was a eagle in flight and so forth and without going into the long lengthy story that he gave me a uh, as to the real meaning of this eagle and what it meant in their lore, I, I bought a couple of them. And he told me, he says, this was the great thunderbird that used to go across the sky. And in their legends, they talked about these birds were made out of strange metal. And I never stopped to think about it before. Why didn't they just say an eagle or a bird? But they talk about these birds back in antiquity and their ancient lore that were to thunder across the sky. Well, later on we'll get into more detail, but I found myself in Peru and I talked to an archaeologist and I brought back some beads. And I couldn't understand why they didn't seem to line up. They didn't make sense. And on closer examination, I found that they were in the shape of like flying saucers and they had fans on them that later on we'll describe that is uh, told about in the Bible. And then I came across one that somebody had worn as an amulet and it looked exactly like one of our space capsules designed exactly like it later on maybe we can get some of these pictures out to you folks but all of this was a great puzzle and I had to go to many different cultures and ancient history and I found that that proved the Bible and many of the things in the Bible that were spoken of they paralleled exactly uh, with these other ancient histories, uh, not looking at the religious aspect because they, as well as Christendom and Judaism, we all have our own opinions on the religious angle. But I think, unfortunately, what one of the problems has been is that people have not bothered to research out the meanings of these words. Uh, I think one thing that really set me off years ago my wife and I, while looking through the scriptures, we came across uh, the 17th chapter of Luke. And we looked it up in several Bibles. I'd started collecting old books, and I had noticed that each translator had represented it a little bit differently. But Christ 
had the disciples asking him where and when's the kingdom going to be and and they were curious as to where the kingdom was going to be established whether it was here on earth or whether it was a place in heaven or let's say outer space and they wondered how they were going to get there christ said something that i think that the religious world has overlooked and not considered and we would cite to you at this time that you might think on this he said wheresoever the body is gathered he said thither will the eagles be gathered well some renditions will tell us that wheresoever the dead body is thither will be the buzzards well there's a world of difference between a live body dead bodies and buzzards and eagles so I became quite confused and I took the Greek and went back into the religious uh, or ancient translations, let's say, of it, because there is a world of difference between the ancient Greek that existed at that time and what is spoken today. If you take the ancient Greek, uh, you would find a modern Greek would have a great deal of difficulty in understanding it. So I went back and I thought, what is he implying there? Now, if I had only done my homework, if I had understood that there was a clue going way back to the beginning of the book. There is a parallel throughout the scriptures, but we're not able to follow it in many cases because of name changes. Uh, our ancestors would talk about the first car, they'd call it a horseless carriage. But in our age, we called it an automobile, we called it a new car. And there's many different ways to describe a vehicle. But getting back to this, Moses was told, and Later on, we're going to give you every jot and tittle, and we're going to quote the passage, but for the sake of time and getting our point across why we have lost and missed many of these secrets, uh, Moses was reminded by the Almighty, the ever-living, the one that people call God, that Moses learned his name was Yahweh. I will call him an extraterrestrial Lord from outer space. He spoke with Moses, and he said, Do you remember when I brought you unto myself? as on eagle's wings safely that puzzled me a great deal and i kind of put that aside and i kind of put this loot 1737 i put that aside and so i went back to one of the oldest writings known to man you might have heard of him it was called gilgamesh it's just a few brief paragraphs but it is uh, stumped and stunned the scientific world and the religious world. Now, by the way, a lot of people don't realize that Gilgamesh was a great king. And uh, I read recently in one of the scientific journals that it claimed that he lived in the area of Lebanon. And he was one of the first great violators of ecology because he saw great forests there and started to cut them down because he thought there was no end to it. But anyway, getting back to our story, it goes that Gilgamesh was taken to outer space in an extraterrestrial ship that he called an eagle. Then it goes on to say that while he was seated in it, seated in it and started to leave the earth plane, that his body was pulled back against his chair. It uh, felt like a lead weight. And today we would call this is a, gravi a gravitational pull. We've all seen pictures of the astronaut, how their mouths are forced open and they're forced back against their seat. So I thought maybe there is something to this word eagle because a man uh, leaving this Earth's atmosphere and going to outer space, uh, what do we expect our progenitors to say? Airplane or spaceship? They had nothing to compare it to, so they had to use the analogy of an eagle. So I became very curious about this, and I thought, now the words throughout uh, this book are not consistent. And let me digress for one moment. We go to Zechariah, the fifth and the sixth chapter, and we find that Zechariah was talking with an angel, as the Greek said, and as uh, I mentioned before, that some of the translators rendered it, it from the true Hebrew, meaning a messenger, someone not from this world. and who in any religious denominations would say that angels are from this world so when we find out the true word is messenger uh, and they're from heaven then we say outer space and that starts to make a little sense to us and so as we go into Zechariah's account also Ezekiel's account where 
they're looking up and they see these clouds and smoke and fire and thunder and they look and the messenger says what do you see he said I see like two mountains of steel and depending on which translation some will say iron some metal some even say copper but then like Ezekiel and Zechariah, they're both very comparable there. They speak of a chariot coming out. And it describes it as being an iron chariot in some instances. And it comes out. And then quite an interesting thing. It says that he looked again. He saw the horses in the chariots that came out of this flying mountain of steel. Well, Ezekiel describes it a little bit different. He said, I saw wheels within wheels within wheels. But then I would ask some of my religious friends that knew the scriptures much better than I did at the time. I said, now, I've heard of getting the cart before the horse, but when you go putting the horses in the cart, that gives me mental indigestion that does not compute, and why not? So when I took the word horse, I got to thinking about it, and I realized that the Greeks spoke of flying horses. And some of you that are my age, remember when mobile oil started out? that they had the symbol of a flying horse called Pegasus uh, from the Greek term. And I found this fascinating, so I looked up the word in the original language. So a horse is not a horse as a horse, of course, as they used to say on Mr. Ed. So I found out what a horse was, the Hebrew, and it also said that it's possibly Hebrew or from the Chaldean language, that it is uh, ancient, little used from an unused root that goes so far back in antiquity they're not sure where the Hebrew people picked it up from but as you study the Hebrew lexicon or the Strong's Concordance or Young's or whichever you prefer you'll find that the original Hebrew word was S-O-O -O, apostrophe S which means soothes and I said now what's a soothes and then it goes on describes what it meant in the Hebrew it said it's like an iron ship or chariot that stretches out. That means it can travel and go a distance. It said with a driver on the inside. Today we would say pilot. So then we compare that back with Ezekiel when he says wheels within wheels within wheels. What I believe that we're going to find, let's go back for another example so you're not going to say this is some uh, Bible thumper, he's a pious pontificating pulpit pounder that's trying to start a new religion. No, we're not an organized religion. We're like a lot of you. We're looking for answers. We're looking for clues to the ancient past. We're trying to find out from whence we came and why are we here and what is our plan and what is our purpose. And we have the audacity to say that we're curious. And if you want to take the scripture, it tells us study to show ourselves approved. Well, I would probably have been a Christian uh, 20 years before I ever opened the Bible if somebody had just given me the answers that brought these things to light. Now I'm going to digress and go back for just a minute, and I find out that Sue's really opens up a whole new world uh, to my understanding, and I hope that uh, I can convey this to you that I can stir your imagination, that you will start to look for these things and that you will hunger and thirst after these curious things that have been hidden from us for 2,000 years. And all I want to do is share some of the keys that made it so easy for me to unlock these history books, unlock uh, this archaeological evidence, unlock it not only from a religious uh, standpoint but from a historical standpoint. Uh, later on we're going to share with you one that we call Bush Pilot where I claim that Moses when I realized it wasn't an angel and it wasn't a burning bush the translators really confused us there that this was literally a bush pilot or a shuttle ship that came to Moses because later on it appears to contradict him because the Almighty or whoever this great extraterrestrial Lord was he said Moses Remember, I brought you to myself. And he said, as on eagle's wings. So we have the analogy, something that flew. Something that Moses was taken in safely. All right, I go back to 
the point that uh, now a lot of preachers try to tell us that this was a bramble bush that was on fire. So for many years, I got to thinking about that. And, and I said, well, let's see. I saw the movie Moby Dick. And there was a strange phenomenon that took place that was called St. Elmo's Fire. This occurs occasionally or in, in rare instances in the atmosphere where the whole ship has a glow to it. It looks like there's electricity all over it. It's all lit up. And I thought, well, maybe this extraterrestrial messenger that they call an angel, he was standing in the bush with all this fire around him. And it's St. Elmo's fire. I thought, well, maybe he's grounded. But then a peculiar thing while he's talking to Moses and my preachers and teachers up the land told me that that was a bramble bush. In other words, had stickers on it. And there was probably a lot of them around there. And so the next thing the angel tells him, take off his shoes, he's on holy ground. Well, now, angels, uh, you want to call them holy or just whatever you want to call them, but I don't think that one angel makes the ground holy. I don't think he makes this earth holy. I don't think there's a holy place on this earth. This is my personal opinion. Later on, we're going to discuss and, and try to get in what does the word holy mean. Is it a great energy field? Or am I missing the boat? Is it just a religious connotation? But I feel that so many of us, when we couldn't answer something, that we made a religious connotation out of it. So visualize this. The angel tells him to take off his shoes and stand there with all of those briars and nettles. That doesn't make sense. But then when I go back and see that this rare t uh, term that they use called a soothe, and supposing, all right, we know later on that Moses indeed did go on a trip. The Almighty, the account says so. So this extraterrestrial messenger called an angel is saying to Moses, get ready to take off in the suit. We're getting ready for takeoff. So that started to make sense. Let me go back for just a moment. Uh, we discussed earlier in Luke 17 and 37 where Christ said, this Messiah of Christendom, he said, wheresoever the body is he's talking about a corporate body of people in Luke 12 and 32 he said I come but from my little flock and it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom he was going to give them something and I said well where's this kingdom and apparently somebody was going to fly to it a kingdom means a government and where was the seat of government located and John said that he had seen it he had been to the holy city he had been to the seat of government and so apparently it seemed like somebody was going to fly there where before I thought the only way you ever got there was have some preacher say ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and heaven won't have you, some other place must. It wasn't the cough that carried you off in, but the coffin that carried you off in. It wasn't often, it was just once. And then you go get your pie in the sky. But I never did go for the idea of running around with a fiddle in my hands and chicken wings on my back and a, and a night shirt. This didn't compute, because I kind of liked my body. And next breath, they tell you about the resurrection, say, I'm going to get this body back, but it's going to be an improved model. But anyway, but what did the word eagle mean? So after researching it out in the very ancient Greek, which is no longer used today, we find that there was some peculiar descriptions of it. First of all, it implies that the Greeks go into detail as to who flew these eagles. It said they were the high-bred fastidious ones. Not a high-bred, but high-bred fastidious ones. They were very responsible. They paid attention to detail. And then it goes into the word circumcumbent. What does circumcumbent mean? That, I'd never heard the word before. It gave me mental indigestion. So on looking it up, it means to take a wind-like flight as to breathe effortlessly. Well, this stymied me for a long time until I got to thinking about when I was back in the Marine Corps and I used to hitch rides across country when I'd go on leave uh, where you could take these free flights on these great transports and some of them would go several miles up in the air. But I had no problem whatsoever breathing. I breathed effortlessly because there was oxygen piped into these planes and I was quite comfortable and at ease while being several miles up in the air. We're just trying to stir your imagination and get you to think and you say, you're trying to tell me that Christ was talking about flying saucers, airplanes, or some sort of vehicle that could take people up in the air? 
If you'll bear with me, I believe that we can prove this. Because as we read in the first chapter of Ecclesiasticus, we're going to cover it in more detail, but it goes on to say, there is nothing new under the sun. No, not one. Now, if you're going to believe this is God's book and you're going to believe it's true, then you better pay attention to it. It said, whatever, depending on it, varies in different translations. But it said, whatever man of old times discovered, it is long forgotten. And in other words, what it's telling us, that we think we've come up with brilliant ideas, somebody already discovered it in ancient times. This is the trouble with so many biblical students. This is the trouble with so many of our scholars because we have not taken the time to research, study, and analyze these many different words that have been mistranslated because the people in the dark ages or whenever, they had nothing to compare it to. They were not living in an electronic age like we are, and we think that we're so sophisticated with our satellites and all of these different things. But I would challenge you, the listener, if you will only bear with me, I believe that I can prove conclusively beyond the shadow of a doubt that the ancient people of antiquity, that they were in close contact with what we would call extraterrestrials. The Bible describes them as angels. Now, just exactly what is an angel? We see on the church windows, we see these fellows standing there in uh, bed sheets and sandals, and they got chicken wings on their back. Well, this is something that started in the Dark Ages. This was some artist's conception, and see, sublimably, we have been ruined by that. Our brain is the most sophisticated uh, computer in all of the universe. It's a flesh and blood computer. As we know today, we have these people that are called hacks. We read on uh, our newspapers about these hackers that are disrupting uh, large corporations by uh, stealing information and adding erroneous information in order to confuse and, and ruin the business of their competitors. And we find that it even has reached into the Pentagon and their computers. Uh, these people feed in what they call a virus. Well, well, let me just speak for myself. I know that I have had so much misinformation uh, of this virus that has been uh, fed into my mind because I assumed that it was real. But now in a computer, uh, all you got to do is pull the floppy disk out. And you can remove it all from your computer and you can start with a clean slate. Well, unfortunately, we can't do that with the human mind. But all we can do is try to learn new information. Like, let's say, for example, the Bible says, prove all things. A lot. So let's go back for a minute. Let's examine what were these so-called angels back in the Old Testament. Let's forget about these angels that we saw in church windows. And I remember I got in a lot of trouble when I was in Sunday school. And I said uh, to the teacher, where do these baby angels come from? She says, those are not baby angels. They're cherubims. I said, they look like angels. If none of them have any deities on. And I said, you told me that these angels can have children, then where did they come from? They said, well, God made them. Well, that's not a scientific answer to me, and this didn't compute. So later on, we're going to find out what is a cherubim, what is represented by the picture on the church wall, and we find that a cherubim is a Greek term like angel. And later on, we're going to have, we're going to have a whole tape going into great, I believe, exciting detail. I believe it will stir your imagination and we go back in the Hebrew what they translate as cherubim we're going to find out that they were called karu speaking in the singular they were talking about karubium and then we're going to hear about seraphims and cherubim and, and then we find uh, in one word that really intrigued me is spelled three or four different ways in the ancient language and I this is the end of side A